Mayer Ras, and the head of the AI, uh, Synthesis AI. He received his MSc from St. Petersburg uh, University in uh, 2005, and his PhD from the Stekolov Institute of Mathematics at St. Petersburg in 2009. And he has uh, co-authored more than 150 research papers in machine learning, analysis of algorithms, and even have a bestseller of a deep learning book. <laughs> so, uh, Sergey. All right. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, I am honored to be here uh, for uh, for this unfortunate occasion, and um, I guess I will also begin with uh, some comments on our collaboration with Kirill and what uh, Kir Kirill meant for me. So uh, this is one of the very, very few photos that I have with Kirill. And I guess this is the best one because uh, it contains not, not only Kirill and myself, but also Vitaly Demyanyuk, who spoke today, and Pavel Chuprikov, another uh, joint PhD student of ours, and Alex Davidov, who also has been a colleague for many years. Um, and um, this is a photo from 2017. And actually, we have been collaborating with Kirill since 2012, so almost uh, 10 years. Um, and um, the, the, this is actually a, a nice story that I guess I, sh I should tell now, because uh, uh, in January 2012, I, I received an email from Kirill, just completely out of the blue. And this email basically said, uh, Hi, Sergey, I'm interested in buffer management, competitive analysis, and I have a few, a few problems, so would you like to collaborate? And uh, I have no idea why Kirill wrote to me. I have no idea how many other people he wrote to at the same time. But uh, I replied, and since then I think this has been uh, the best uh, research collaboration in my life. And I am very, very grateful to Kirill for all these years and for all this uh, work that we have done together. Uh, and also with other people, of course. Uh, I counted before this talk, we had, we've had 43 joint papers. That's obviously the most I have with anybody. And I guess this record will stand. So um, as for my talk today, um, well, to, to be honest, I think I have misjudged the audience. I kind of assumed that uh, this, since this is a memorial seminar, there will be lots of people with different backgrounds. And I prepared kind of an introductory talk about what, uh, uh, how competitive analysis is used in buffer management, what it all means, and uh, uh, how, and what were the main results that Kirill brought into the field. Judging from the first several talks, I have been badly mistaken about the audience, um, but I guess I have no choice but to... Sergey, Sergey, yeah. let me interrupt you, but the, the speakers <laughs> are uh, familiar with the uh, buffer management and uh, yeah. application, but the audience here are not, so it's good, it's fine. Okay, good, good. Uh, so anyway, uh, let me maybe for the introduction, let me maybe switch to the whiteboard and just explain what... Uh, this whole field is about, and then we'll 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 go into the results that Kirill brought here. So, um, okay, I, I still think that everybody here is familiar with the general idea of buffer management, right? So you have some kind of a buffer, and packets come come in, and the buffer somehow processes them, and obviously we'll come back to that later, and then packets come out, right? So in buffer management, usually there are three parts of what's, what's going on. The first part is the admission of new packets, right? The second part is the processing, which is done inside the buffer. And the third part is the transmission, uh, which is usually relatively simple, where the packets go out and go to their next destination. So, uh, this is the general idea, and now the, the details can be very, very different. And that's why uh, we need this whole science, and that's why we need the, the whole slew of very different results here. So uh, what can be different here? Well, first of all, obviously the buffer, the buffering architecture can be different. 
right? So the buffer can be a single queue where packets are lined up one after another and uh, uh, there will be results about this case too, though for now it seems trivial, but we will see that it's not. Um, it can be, for example, an output queue buffer where uh, you have several output ports and each output port has its own queue, right? Or it can be a crossbar switch, uh, probably the most complex architecture that we will speak about today, uh, where you have several input ports and several output ports and you have a separate queue for each pair of input and output ports. So there is a queue on each intersection here and it can hold its own packets. So this would be the crossbar switch. Um, so the first, uh, let me say, the first uh, point of variety, the first uh, branching point of all of these results is the buffering architecture. The second uh, point, and this, I guess, is already where uh, Kirill's contribution come into play because he was one of the first and definitely one of the uh, most uh, important people in considering this, this branching point. The, sec the second po branching point is, uh, are the different characteristics of the packets, right? So uh, in the classical works on uh, buffer management, uh, packets are usually assumed to be uniform. So all packets are the same. And of course, this makes, for example, the single queue trivial. If all packets are the same and you have a single queue, you don't have a choice, right? All packets go into the queue, all packets come out of the queue, that's it. Um, but in reality, of course, packets are different and they can have different characteristics. So when a packet comes into the buffer, um, it may have, uh, they may be different and there are different, um, uh, and, and what, can, what can these characteristics be? So first of all, there, a packet can have value, which basically means that some packets can have higher priority, more value, and basically value is what the packet uh, adds to the objective function. So we want to, if we need to drop something, and the, the whole point of uh, uh, buffer management is to try to uh, avoid dropping packets, uh, to try to avoid congestion in the buffer when there are too many packets, but buffer gets, uh, is overflown and you have to drop something uh, or you have to not admit something. Uh, so if, there, if the packets have value, values, then of course uh, you would like to drop packets with lowest values and transmit packets with highest values. If you, uh, the packets can also have, uh, and that's definitely uh, some of uh, the Kirill's contribution that we'll consider, uh, packets can have processing requirements, which means that different packets can spend, uh, can require different computational resources for, from the buffer uh, to process them. And in, in, our, uh, in our papers, it, it is usually abstracted to uh, a single number, let's say R, the processing requirement, uh, which uh, says how many cycles, how many time slots and we always assume that time is discrete, how many discrete time slots this packet has to spend at the head of line before it can be transmitted, right? So after uh, each time slot, this number is reduced by one, and when it is reduced to one, then on the next time slot it is transmitted and it's done, right? So if you have packets with different processing requirement, then uh, 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 this means that uh, you probably, if they have equal value, you probably want to prioritize packets with low processing requirement because they can be processed faster and they can be uh, transmitted, right? Um, then there can also be, packets can also have different size. Uh, I don't think I'll speak about this kind of setting today, uh, but obviously different packets can 
take different number of slots in the buffer, different amount of memory. Uh, and um, yeah, and I think that's it. And also there is a, the, the obvious characteristic, which is uh, more dependent on the architecture. And that is, for example, in this architecture, a packet would have uh, the output port where it wants to go, right? And in this uh, architecture, a packet would be characterized by a pair of input and output port, uh, where it comes from and where it wants to go at the, at the end, right? So uh, these are, and basically every combination of these two parameters gives you a different setting, right? And almost all of these settings make sense in uh, various uh, networking contexts. So uh, how do we analyze algorithms? How do we analyze buffer management algorithms? Well, uh, there is, of course, this classical queuing theory, which uh, is mostly a statistical science that makes assumptions about uh, statistical properties of incoming streams of packets. And based on these assumptions, uh, outputs uh, various, uh, makes uh, predictions about the statistical properties of output streams, right? But uh, in reality, of course, these kind of assumptions are very, sel very seldom hold always. And what we really want is we want the switch to perform well in the worst case. So uh, it doesn't really matter uh, how it performs when it's not congested, right? Because it will transmit all packets anyway. But what, what is important is uh, how, it, how it performs at peak traffic times, at times when the incoming sequence of packets is very unfortunate. So the uh, these kind of algorithms are usually analyzed with uh, what is called competitive analysis. And competitive analysis uh, means that you have a buffering architecture, right? You have uh, incoming streams of packets, you have output packets. And uh, what you want to maximize is you want to maximize the total objective function of uh, transmitted packets. So in the simplest case, if they don't have values, then you just want to maximize the number of packets that you transmit or the fraction of packets that you tra transmit compared to what you receive. Uh, so competitive analysis means that you take this number, you take this fraction of packets that you transmit with your algorithm, uh, with the algorithm ALG, and let's say there is this objective function, right? And uh, you compare it to the same objective function that could be theoretically achievable with an optimal clairvoyant offline algorithm that just knows everything in advance, it knows the whole sequence of packets, it knows everything. Uh, and if, uh, and so an online algorithm definitely usually cannot be optimal, in the, only in very rare cases we can achieve true optimality. So usually the online algorithm will work uh, somewhat worse than the optimal algorithm. But if we can bound it, for example, uh, by a multiplicative constant, if we can say that, uh, sorry, the other way around, if we can say that our algorithm, uh, no, the other way around, there we go. If we can say that our algorithm is at least alpha times worse than the optimal algorithm, then we say that our algorithm is alpha competitive, right? And uh, that is the main uh, theoretical tool for worst case analysis of online algorithms, not only in buffer management, but in other computer science fields as well. Uh, and basically this leads to three different kinds of results. So the first kind of result is uh, a lower bound for a specific algorithm. And a lower bound for a specific algorithm is usually the simplest, the most straightforward kind of result. So uh, basically all you have to do is you need to provide the counter example. So a lower bound means that the algorithm is performing badly, right? So a lower bound in the competitive ratio means that you have found a bad case uh, where your algorithm performs that many times worse than the optimal, right? So 
to prove a lower bound for a specific algorithm, you just need to find a counterexample. And usually it's relatively simple. The second kind of result is a general, is a, a general adversarial lower bound. And that is more interesting uh, already. Uh, and that is the kind of theorem where you prove that, um, say, any in a given setting, so for a given buffering architecture and for a given uh, set of packet characteristics, for given parameters and so on and so forth, uh, all, or I should say, any deterministic online algorithm is bounded, is, is at least that competitive. So this is uh, a, a lower bound uh, for all algorithms, for all online deterministic algorithms. And this is, of course, a more difficult theorem. Now you have a quantifier of algor algorithms. It actually uh, sounds, uh, uh, on the surface, it sounds like a very difficult theorem. But so, and it is more difficult than just finding counterexample, but usually it goes like this. Usually you're, you're just constructing an adversarial counterexample to uh, that depends on the choices that the algorithm makes. So uh, you start by, uh, you start constructing a counterexample, which is basically a sequence of incoming packets. And then you say, all right, so if the algorithm drops this packet, then we do this. And if the algorithm drops that packet, then we do that. And uh, this is uh, how you can, uh, and if in both cases uh, the optimal algorithm can do better, because the optimal algorithm knows in advance what's going to happen, then um, this gives you an adversarial lower bound. So this is a more difficult theorem, uh, and the most difficult theorems are always the upper bounds, right? So uh, here I cannot give you a, a simple answer to what is the method and how, how can you prove an, an upper bound for uh, on the competitive ratio. But uh, upper bounds are uh, what we are mostly looking for. So if you have an upper bound on the competitive ratio, then it means that uh, this algorithm is good, right? So this algorithm is at most that competitive, which means that it is, it is we have proven a worst case guarantee on how well this algorithm performs compared to other algorithms. Yeah. So uh, this is this is a brief introduction to uh, competitive analysis and uh, uh, how it relates to buffer management. So now let me go back to the slides and now let me turn to uh, specific results that uh, to an overview of results that Kirill uh, uh, introduced to this field. Okay, so I already spoke through this. Each packet can have various characteristics. Uh, there we can have many different architectures. And yeah, there, there is also one more uh, degree of freedom that I forgot to mention. Uh, if packets are uniform, if all packets are the same, then it doesn't matter. But uh, as soon as the packets are non-uniform, we also have uh, different variations of how the, the queues are organized. So for every queue, uh, or for a single queue, if it's only one, uh, you can have, us usually it's one of two things. Either you have a priority queue. So for instance, you prioritize high value packets. So then in your queue, the packets will be sorted according to value. Or you can have a first in first out queue where the packets are sorted according to time of arrival. And that is usually an external requirement. You are say, required to do uh, FIFA processing. And so you are stuck with FIFA queues. Priority queues are better, uh, but uh, they also require some additional computation right, to, to support this data structure. OK, and uh, we always assume discrete time. The each time slot uh, contains three phases, usually arrival when new packets come in. Uh, assignment and processing, so we choose which packets to process. Uh, the slide says a single packet, but it actually depends on the architecture that can be multiple packets trans uh, processed. And then transmission, when the packet has been a packet has been processed, it can be transmitted and can leave the queue, and that's a good thing, right? Um, and uh, yeah, I, I already talked through the competitive ratios, and uh, 
this whole field kind of uh, started in 2001. Maybe you can correct me if there are earlier works. But in 2001, there was this uh, uh, influential work uh, about a shared memory switch where the packets are uniform, uh, but it has several different output. Uh, it has multiple output ports, right? And each output port has its own queue. And the only decision is if the buffer, it has shared memory, so a common uh, upper bound on the, on the memory. And there is only one question. If a new packet arrives and the whole, uh, and the, the, the memory is full, the buffer is congested, then which queue do you drop a packet from? Because it doesn't matter which packet, they're all the same. Uh, so the natural policy is longest queue drop, drop a packet from the longest queue, queue on congestion. And this was, I guess, the first paper where all three of these kind of results appeared. So they showed that LQD is at least square root of two competitive, my counterexample. Uh, they showed an adversarial lower bound of four thirds uh, on any deterministic online algorithm. And they also showed an upper bound uh, on LQD, which is uh, that LQD is at most two competitive. So there is this uh, tantalizing gap between the square root of two and two, which actually we are uh, we, we have been closing lately, but uh, that's, that's a very different story. Um, yeah, let me maybe skip this one. So the, the first paper of Kirill uh, about uh, this topic dealt with a crossbar switch. So already a very uh, complex architecture, but still, uh, and already non-uniform packets, packets with values. So uh, it had uh, uh, it had each each input port has a collection of queues for each output port, and then from these queues, sub queues from these uh, in input queues, uh, packets were sent to output output queues, right? To queues for the output ports. Uh, the buffers were first in, first out, and. Uh, this was the paper where Kirill introduced, or obviously I don't know the exact contributions, but where uh, the authors introduced what is called the beta preemptive greedy policy, which uh, made appearances in other settings as well. So uh, the input and output buff buffers are greedy, but we move packets to output queues only if they are uh, significantly better than one we what we have in the output queue. So we drop packets only if um, uh, their value, we, we add packs to output queues, we mark them as eligible for, for this only if the, uh, their value is beta times higher than we, what we have in the output queues. And they proved an upper bound on this. Okay. Uh, and the, the next paper that I wanted to mention, uh, and this is our first joint work with Kirill back in 2012. Uh, the architecture now is very simple. It's just a single queue, but now packets have different processing requirements. So uh, this is a sample time slot. I guess uh, this picture kind of speaks for itself. So first new packets arrive and this pack packet is characterized by a single number that have uniform values, but they have different processing requirements. And the buffer has some packets when they arrive, right? So we have one free slot in the buffer, say the memory is five. Uh, and uh, what we do next is, what we do first actually, after new packets arrive, we choose which ones to put in the buffer. And they, in this case, they, this is a FIFO buffer, so they will go at the end. Uh, and also which ones to drop. So uh, we are allowed to drop, to not admit new packets, but we are also allowed to push out packets from the buffer itself. Uh, in this case, uh, the, so the, this, this algorithm, uh, this, this is a very natural algorithm. It uh, uh, prioritizes low processing requirements, so it just pushes out packets with highest uh, uh, highest requirements, and that's how it works, right? So after I will have this, and then we we do processing, which reduces this one to zero, and when it's zero, it means that we can transmit, and now we have again one free slot, and we are waiting for the new URL. So that's the that's the setting, and uh, this was the the setting was the beginning of our collaboration with Kirill, uh, and um, yeah, again, I, I will not dwell on the specific uh, results, but uh, 
let me just say that uh, in, in our first paper we analyzed, uh, we, we tried to analyze the, this very natural preemptive greedy algorithm which uh, uh, just pushes out uh, packets uh, with high processing requirements. But it turned out, and this was actually, I think, Real's idea, uh, it turned out uh, that it is very hard to analyze this, this algorithm. Right, and uh, the idea was to introduce a new class of algorithms, which will probably not uh, be implemented in practice, because uh, as we will see, they are, they, I mean, kind of don't make much intuitive sense, but which are much easier to analyze, and then hopefully the results from these uh, what we call lazy push-out algorithms will. Uh, transfer to regular algorithms as well. So a lazy push-out algorithm does the same, but it does not transmit until its whole buffer, its whole queue is full of ones. So until every packet has only one uh, time slot left for processing, so you can basically transmit them all one by one uh, in, in uh, subsequent time slots. And uh, this sounds crazy, right? This sounds crazy. This sounds like uh, uh, an obviously weakened version of, of, of the basic PO algorithm, right? The lazy push-out algorithm uh, does the same as the regular push-out algorithm, but for some reason it doesn't transmit when it can. So it uh, sounds stupid, but uh, actually in the worst case they are incomparable. You can find uh, sequences of packets where LPO is better. And uh, what is, of course, the most important, we were able to prove a logarithmic upper bound on the competitive ratio of LPO. And it's logarithmic in K, which is the maximal uh, processing requirement. Um, so it's uh, usually a constant in practice. So, um, yeah. And then in the next paper, we generalized this a little bit. We introduced lazy versions of many, many different, uh, uh, of many different algorithms. And this, this was our second, I guess, or third paper, Taxonomy of semi for Policies. Uh, so we basically for uh, defined a class of uh, lazy, poli lazy buffer management policies, and we were able to actually prove uh, a general upper bound for all lazy policies, which uh, also sounds uh, which, which sounds great, and it's also logarithmic, but this time the uh, base of the logarithm is not as good as before. So uh, they differ in the processing order, and uh, for some processing order this is a tight bound, and as we already saw, for some processing orders uh, we can do even better. Right, so, uh, and for the best of them, for the LPQ algorithm, which is lazy, but also a priority queue. So it processes and transmits packet, uh, it processes packets in reverse order of their processing requirement, but um, at the same time, uh, it is lazy, so it waits for its buffer to be full of ones before transmission. So for this, we could actually prove that it's too competitive and it's a uh, tight bound. So it's uh, two minus, uh, some vanishing constant, uh, some vanishing term uh, uh, in, in, in the worst case. I will skip the, the, these results. Uh, and um, basically, this is a, a great example of what uh, uh, a paper work in uh, competitive analysis for buffer management looks like. So we consider a specific setting, we uh, introduce specific algorithms, usually uh, thinking of the algorithms is the easy part. So they are kind of obvious, well, priority queue, uh, but sometimes you, so, sometimes uh, it, it takes work to, to, to introduce algorithms as well, as in the case of this lazy family, that, that was not obvious. But then the hard part is, of course, to prove the theorems, right? The hard part is to uh, prove lower bounds and much harder uh, proof upper bounds on the competitive ratios. and. If you are able to prove, say, uh, a logarithmic or a constant upper bound, then you're good. And if, for example, the lower bound is linear, then that's probably a bad algorithm, at least in the worst case. All right, so uh, with this, 
I guess uh, I'm almost done. I will just mention a, a few more settings uh, that were that we considered in subsequent works. So in the next paper, 2013, uh, we had a multi-queue buffer, and there were two different settings here. In one setting, each queue was responsible for packets of a specific kind. So uh, in this case, uh, we still consider different uh, processing requirements and pack uh, packets of each specific processing requirement went into their own queues, right? Uh, so in this case, uh, yeah, again, there are several natural uh, algorithms that you can consider. And uh, for one of them, we were able to prove a constant upper bound. Um, let me skip this one. And uh, next, yeah, sorry, this, this is the same. Uh, so yeah, uh, the next variation would be if you have um, in, uh, packets labeled with uh, output queues and still heterogeneous processing requirements. So uh, they, they go to different output queues uh, and then they get processed in the same way as in our previous paper uh, in a single queue. Right. So, but uh, the difference is that now the, this is a shared memory buffer. So the total memory requirement is the same. Is common is that there is a common memory upper memory bound for all queues, and you need to choose from which queues to drop the packets. So uh, we consider this with Patrick, who I guess will be speaking right after me, uh, and. Um, mm, Again, th there were two papers. Uh, in the first paper, we kind of conjectured uh, an algorithm that might have constant competitiveness, but were not able to prove it. And in the second paper, we disproved this conjecture and prove a, a different constant upper bound. So that's, that, that, that those were the results. Uh, and maybe I, I will finish with this couple of papers. Uh, the next uh, obvious generalization, or I should say maybe just the next obvious setting, would be to consider packets that have multiple characteristics. So I didn't mention that, but in all of those previous papers, we also considered packets with not with required processing, but with values. Uh, so each packet takes only one time slot to process, but uh, packets have contribute differently to the objective function. Uh, usually the the case of values is easier, and uh, usually it was kind of a side note to the main results about required processing. But what if packets have both? What if packets have both uh, heterogeneous processing requirements and heterogeneous values? And in this case, and this is where uh, Pavel actually joined us and uh, started his PhD work. Uh, in this case, it's in the case of a single queue with uh, a single characteristic, it was almost obvious that the priority queue is optimal and it's very easy to prove. So if you have, say, different values, then you just process and transmit packets with highest values first. It's optimal, obviously. If you have different processing requirements, you tr process and transmit packets with uh, lowest processing requirements first. It's a, it's a, it's. A, uh, optimal. The, all, all of these previous papers dealt with uh, FIFO, process, uh, FIFO processing where you cannot do that, right? So if you could do a priority queue, it would be obviously best. Uh, in this case, it's not obviously best. And actually, in this case, there are many different priority queues that you can have, right? So you can have a priority queue that uh, sorts by um, uh, processing requirement first and then value, or I should say value and then processing requirement, uh, you can have a pr priority queue that sorts the other way around. So first processing requirement, then value, or you can have a priority queue that computes some kind of uh, joint uh, characteristic, for example, the ratio, like the how much unit value do we get from a single uh, time slot of processing. And these are all different cases, and the, the, there are different theorems about that. Uh, and again, we proved some kind of general lower bound, we proved some upper bounds, and this was also, uh, uh, I guess, a very interesting paper where uh, with, with a lot of different uh, upper and lower bounds in the competitive ratio. So 
to sum up, um, we have seen, I, I have introduced to you this general field of buffer management with uh, competitive analysis. The whole point is to have worst case guarantees. So all of the theorems that I mentioned, uh, their purpose is to have um, algorithms with hopefully constant or at least not very bad upper bounds in the competitive ratio. So the whole point is to have uh, buffer management policies that are um, uh, that have that are guaranteed to work reasonably well even against uh, adversarial inputs, even against the, the hardest possible uh, input sequence of packets. And then uh, the, the whole field branches out in many different directions. So you can have different buffering architectures, you, ha you can have different uh, characteristics of packets and uh, combinations of characteristics of packets. And so there are many, many constant settings. And of course, uh, Kirill had plans in this field for continuation of this work. Uh, and actually, our last works were about extending these same methods of analysis, so the same kind of online algorithms and the same kind of competitive analysis to other fields, such as, for example, uh, job scheduling uh, or analyzing compute aggregate problems in uh, uh, distributed uh, computational environments. But unfortunately, we will have to continue this work without Kirill. And uh, with that, I thank you for your attention and uh, thank you for the honor of uh, letting me speak at this event. Thank you. So, yeah, thank you very much. And we have uh, time for uh, one question. Hi, uh, thank you for the high level overview. It helped me to understand what this. Uh, field is about and I have a very basic question because this is not my field of research but I couldn't help wondering uh, through the talk why a buffer is actually needed so I understand the packets are traveling to place to from place to place but why do you need a buffer um, well for, first of all you need to uh, send the packets to different destinations in, in some settings right so you need to process, uh, you need to, for example, send them to different output ports. Uh, in case of a single queue, uh, if it was just a single queue with uniform packets and you don't have to do anything, then you don't need a buffer. But uh, in, in, in our setting, for example, you, you, you want to do some kind of processing on the packets inside the switch. And this processing can be different. You can, for example, do uh, packet classification that uh, p people mentioned, right? So you want to check the header of the packet and match it against something, and that's that's one way. Or you can you you can have say deep packet inspection uh, and traffic analysis stuff like this. So uh, anything that so a switch usually has to do something with the packet before it can transmit it further, right? And the buffer is needed because uh, packets can arrive very quickly and uh, sometimes there, there, there arrive more packets than the switch is able to immediately process. So you need to store them somewhere and that's the buffer. Did I answer the question or? Yes, you, you did, okay. thank you. So yeah, thank you again. <coughs> thank you very much. Our next test.